feet away from Mary. So hopefully, whoop, your meeting has been recorded, but okay. All right. Um, anyhow, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some extreme bird watching and kind of how I got started. So I had to kind of dig deep in my archives. And then we're going to have a little fun. I, uh, I have some of the photography I've done over the years, and we're going to have kind of a um, see if you can identify the photos. That's why I said if you have a pen and paper uh, handy, it would be great. And I'm, I'm sure Mary is going to put up a big uh, uh, bonus for anybody that can get all of them. I, is that, that's right, I hope, Mary, but uh, hope not speaking out of turn. But we got some tough ones, Mary, so I think we can stump everybody. But um, keep moving along here. So just kind of talking about how, how I got I got started. It, uh, one last thing I want, just want to explain, I'm going to be talking about some of my North Atlantic projects that I worked on. And uh, I did this 50 years ago. So everything I have is in slides and very hard to turn over digitally. So when I do talk about some of the North American, North uh, Atlantic type things here, I'm, I'm using some three stock photos that are not mine. When we get into the little ID program later on, those will all be my photos. So just, I wanna make that clear. But uh, um, I, I kind of got started because of my dad. You know, he was, he was a, a big birder and you can see this book in front of you here. Uh, it's about a 12 pound book he used to haul around Birds of America and I, in fact, I still have it. But that in his binoculars, he was a carpenter by profession. So he enjoyed putting down his hammer and grabbing the binoculars, but you know, as a teenager, I, you know, my dad, oh, look here, I rebuild woodpecker, you know, and like, you know, I would say, oh yeah, it looks like Woody the Woodpecker dad, you know, it didn't mean a whole lot, but I, I think that was kind of my embryonic start of enjoying birds. And uh, finally, when I got to college, I, I got into ornithology. And if in front of you right now, there's a, a redneck grebe there, I had a fantastic uh, ornithology professor, uh, and uh, he and I used to spend a lot of time out in the bush, in particular a place called Marsh Lake. I went to school up at uh, University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, and just about 20 miles southwest of Oshkosh was this place called Rush Lake. It was a lake, but it was a, a marsh with, with no cottages or anything on it, and a lot of rare things were popping up there. And one of the things was a redneck grebe. And then we ended up finding out that it was nesting. And we were the first to ever identify nesting redneck grebes in Wisconsin. Now this is back in 1968, ways back, you know, 40, 55 years ago. And then, uh, so for my graduate work, I started searching around Wisconsin, seeing if we could find it nesting in other locations. And, the thing is, it's a very solitary bird. It doesn't, will never nest or go on a lake where there are cottages, but it needs at least a 10 acre lake to take off. It takes a running start over the water to be able to get out. So it needed a, a big enough lake. So, but anyhow, after a, a whole summer of research, climbing through some very rustic lakes that, that we only could find with aerial photos, uh, we did find it on, on three different lakes in Wisconsin and uh, did, you know, put that on the records and we found the, the pH of the water and the type of rush that it needed and everything else. So it was, it was kind of an early start for me. And uh, um, anyhow, it, it really, you know, increased my interest. And uh, so like Mary had mentioned, first part of my career, I was a biology teacher. So here I was, you know, single biology teacher, right? Summer's off. Boy, I just signed a new contract full time for $14,000 a year. Wow, you know, I was on the top of the world. So what did I do? Well, I start packing up my cameras and binoculars and everything. And, and I'm, I'm going to take off. I'm going to go find out where these redneck grebes really do do a nest. Hopefully in front of you now, there's gonna be a, a picture of some of the locations that I went to. And uh, uh, if the picture is up there, I'm not sure if my pointer works or not. Um, I'm pointing to some islands up there, the Baffin Islands, it's kind of a, 
to your left of the word Greenland up up there. And that's where it would be a real good spot, the ultimate location to find my, my redneck greaves. But I started a little farther away. So I thought, well, I'm going to start over in Norway and then, and, and then start moving west. And I'll end up with the Baffin Islands and looking for the redneck greaves. So now, 50 some years ago, people didn't really get into the type of thing we're talking about, uh, researching these areas. So one of the first areas I went to was the Lofoten Islands up in, in Norway. And, you know, once again, this was BC before computers, right? No Google searches. I had no idea where I was going or what I was going to find or anything else. So, you know, I, I rent a car and, and it took weeks going up to their Norwegian coast. And uh, first of all, there was a big language barrier in most of the small little communities I was in, but I finally ended up way up there where it's showing the Lofoten Islands way out on the end. Nobody except one teenage kid spoke English, but this is where I finally, I found bird heaven. I mean, there were birds, everywhere every north atlantic bird you could think of at that time was was nesting up there so it was really a gold mine for me that was one of my first stops this took place over four year period every summer i would go and the nesting time is primarily june so i'll tell you the first of june when school ended out i was off to these locations next place was into the uh, north northern edges of scotland really and that was a very nice area. Um, in fact, uh, there was a farms along the coast, so the, the farmers put me up, let me stay, and they fed me for 10 bucks a night, so I spent an, uh, a month there, and once again, a good site. We'll talk a little bit more about that. In fact, they even stopped in to see Nessie and Inverness on the way up there, too. It was kind of funny, because when I got home from that particular trip, the front page of Time Magazine, maybe you remember back in the early 70s, there was this picture, some of you might remember, there was a picture of a, a mom and a, a baby Nessie swimming across the uh, 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 Inverness or Lake Ness. <laughs> so anyhow, um, from there, I, next year I was up in, uh, in uh, Iceland and off, actually it just falls inside the, uh, Arctic Circle, there's a little island up there called Grimsey, and uh, just really a remote little place. And, uh, and funny, because it, it, there's only 54 people that live up there. It's a little fishing area, no trees, just not a lot of birds, but just a hard place to maneuver. But notably, this is the place where all the famous chess map remember when bobby fisher played that russian i forgot whoever it was uh, that's where they they held their chess match on this little island but that was an interesting place and then uh one of my other favorite spots was in newfoundland and this is something that's very reachable for you i'll talk a little bit more about this but there there's an island just called gull island off the southern coast of uh of just trying to move my little thing here, or uh, southern coast of, of uh, uh, Newfoundland. And uh, at the time, it's very well protected now. But at the time, you know, I just went to the Newfoundland DNR and said, hey, can I get permission to go out there? And uh, uh, so they, they said, sure. Well, first of all, he says, the, the little town you got to go to to get close to it, he says, there are no roads. He says, all these little towns along the coast are only accessible by boat. And, uh, and he says, you know, there's no way out there except with fishermen. So it was really kind of an inter interesting experience because I, there I was, I had my little Volkswagen Beetle, fortunately was high off the ground and I took little dirt paths and got to the town. And uh, once I got there, uh, I had to get a couple of fishermen to, you know, I, paid them 20 bucks or something that go out on their fishing run and they get near this island. So they says, yeah, come on down five o'clock in the morning. We'll be out on our fishing run. So I get down there and here's this little 20 foot boat. We're going to go out into the ocean with it. We just a handmade boat had a little motor on it. And 
I had to go on their salmon fishing run first as on our way out there. And they ended up dropping me off out on this island. You know, I, I never, <laughs> I never told anybody where I was. If they did, they didn't come back and get me. I was really in deep trouble. But uh, anyhow, it was really an, an amazing place. And it was one of the, 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 the best puffin habitats that I was ever on. And coincidentally, I took my wife there about oh, six, seven years ago, and I took her out. And, you know, now this island's a protected area. You can't go out there. And uh, so they have boat rides. So I, I went and found this, these guys, a former fisherman, fishing industry had died. So now they give little boat tours. And, and by total coincidence, this guy was the son of the fisherman. I had a picture of the guy, the son of the fisherman that took me out there 50 years before. So, but uh, it, it, was, it was kind of a funny story. All right, so puffins were, were a big thing. If maybe a puffin picture is popping up on your screen right now. This is actually one of my, my pictures. <laughs> And I, I have a picture, you know, at home, and it's it's a, it's a giant picture, the only pish, picture of a puffin my wife has ever seen. And uh, you know, when she looks at this picture, she thought, "Gee, you know, it looks the size of a, you know, a, a giant king penguin or something like that." So when we finally got up in Newfoundland and she saw him, <laughs> and they're only the size of a duck, she says, "How come they're so small?" You know, because she had this impression of these things being so big for so many years. Um, so the interesting about thing about puffins, people don't realize that puffins really, uh, they're burrowing birds. They, they don't nest on the rocks or the cliffs like a lot of the other, other birds that we'll be talking about do. And uh, um, so there's kind of grassy knolls and the steeper it gets, that's kind of a priority place for a puffin because they want to be able to, to uh, have a quick escape. They, they, they don't fly very well. They have very primitive wings. In fact, their wings are more functional for um, in the water. You can actually see them flying with their wings right underneath the surface of the water going after fish. So, when you approach a puffin, I found out if you start low and you start moving up the slope, you won't get any place near them because that's their only route and they need this steep cliff to be able to take off. The ones that are up at more on the gradual up on top, the gradual slope, what happens is when they take off, they bounce on the ground about three or four times before they get you know, airlifted. But if I came from the top, I could go and get maybe three, four feet away from them. So it was, it was really pretty interesting to see them. Uh, the next picture should be coming up here in a second. Um, is uh, it, you can see the, the, the colorful uh, bills and eyes. And that is only during mating season. There is no sex dimorphism with these birds. In fact, the, the, like by that I mean in the male and the female look identical. But the, you can see how colorful they are, and they actually go and they clack bills together, and it's part of their their uh, mating mating ritual. But uh, this is a, a burrow that they they dig in, and I have never seen them actually burrowing, or how they use their bill. It, it's it's still a mystery. It's one thing I didn't find out, but uh, it's they usually have one egg down there, and uh, so. Um, Puffins are, are, are just re really amazing little critters. So next thing coming up is something called a myrrh. And this, uh, the Europeans call them gallimuts. And these are probably what we would consider uh, our penguins of, of the North. And uh, uh, they, they look much like a penguin. They don't, they stand way back. Their legs are located very, way back on their bodies. So they're, they're kind of primitive, kind of like a loon would be. A loon can't really stand up very well. These guys are, are, are the same way. And the unique thing about both the MERS and the other, the whole category of bird are called the alcids and, and the, the puffins and so on. They come to shore for one month a year. 
to lay their egg, have their young, and they go out into the ocean. And it's still somewhat of a mystery where they go, but they spent their whole life, 11 months, they're in the water. They never come to land. Only time they come to land is to, to, uh, to, to nest and lay their eggs. Now the myrrh, um, it's kind of an unusual nest maker, first of all. It doesn't use any weeds or twigs or anything else. So the next picture that should be up here showing you is a, um, an egg. And the egg is really triangular. And at the top end in this picture here is, is real heavy and dense so that when they lay their egg, their egg won't roll off the cliff. They just come and they, they are on some of the most unique areas on the side of a cliff. Shortly, there should be another picture here of, of two myrrhs uh, with their egg. And that they come and they, they land there. Like once again, you can see they, they don't have the ability where their location of the legs to walk very much. So they, they come, they lay their egg without anything to hold it in place. And once it gets close to hatching, they act, the egg will actually start rolling, but it rolls in a, hopefully in a tight circle and won't go off the cliff. And they weigh, uh, each couple will, will lay um, one egg. And the interesting about all this is that uh, these walls, if you would see a faraway picture of these, these cliffs, they're, they're just very rugged rock cliffs. They're just whitewashed with, with um, bird dung. And uh, uh, when you look at the cliff, when the eggs are laid, you can see the bird is black and white, all right? And before the egg hatches, all the birds face inward. And they actually kind of take that egg and they'll prop it between their two feet and hold it against their body to help keep it warm and incubate it. So when you see this cliff, the cliff looks totally black. It's just, it's amazing. And as soon as the chicks hatch, and they all seem to hatch within a very close time period, I have, I've found, all of a sudden, they turn around and they face outward. So then if you see the cliff, the cliff will look all white. It's, uh, um, so here's one of the chicks hatching. You see, uh, uh, as soon as this happens, they'll all start facing outward. Now, one of the most spectacular sights I've ever seen uh, in birding is what happens next. Seems like, and I only saw it once of all the different sites, that the timing is very specific for this. All these little chicks will hatch, and then um, they just get to the point where their, their wings are starting to develop. And all of a sudden, there is this huge chatter and cry on, on, on the wall with all these birds. And what's happening is that just the excitement and it, what happens is they, all, all the young ones will jump off the cliff at the same time. It's it just, a lot of them will, will be immature yet, will fall to their death. A lot of them are just capable, of, because of the steepness of the cliff, of just flying down and landing into the ocean. And then they end up pairing up with, with some adult, it's not necessarily their, their, uh, their parent, but they swim off the sea and all of a sudden the cliff will be vacant and you won't see anything happening un until the following year. So and I spent a lot of time, what, what I was doing at this particular time, I was working on, on my master's and I, so I was writing up a lot of this documentation um, as part of my master's thesis at this point, which was going to be biology although I end up taking some twists and turns here. So another thing that, uh, another nice place, an interesting place to see is once again in Newfoundland, maybe some of you have been in Newfoundland, but they're on the tip of a, the, one of the peninsulas down south is called uh, the Cape of St. Mary. And it's one of the largest um, gannet um, nesting areas uh, in, in the world. And uh, there's a place called The Rock. And what happened just 
part of the cliff broke off and it's only maybe 15 feet away from the, the shoreline cliff. So it just separated. And because of that, this, this big hunk of rock, which is probably about the, the size of River Edge's building, um, all the gannets can come there and don't have to worry about any predators because they can't jump across this 15 foot area. But this rock is covered with thousands and thousands of gannets. They are so closely packed together. And, you know, I don't know when they, they come, they're constantly going in and out, feeding and coming back, how they can never find their spot again. But it's just amazing thing to see. And when, when I first went there 50 years ago, I heard about this lighthouse and I thought there was a potential of some nesting site. Didn't know about the gannets. Nobody told me. You know, it wasn't anything you read about. And I got out to this lighthouse out on the end there and talked to the lighthouse um, keeper. And it was pretty foggy. And he says, hey, he says, you know, all these gannets are right th down the path here. So um, there wasn't anything there. He says, you're welcome to stay. So I, I pinched a, pitched my tent right next to this cliff with these gannets and stayed there for about a week. It was an amazing sight seeing all these birds. So jump ahead 50 years, I took my wife there and <laughs> the exact spot where my tent was is now this like $5 million guest center. You know, everybody comes to see the gannets. So I was kind of ahead of, ahead of the, uh, the curve, I guess, at that particular time. Um, anyhow, like I said, uh, um, I ended up um, kind of changing my course. I was I was a teacher, still a teacher at that time, and I I got into uh, special education. So um, I I went and completed my my master's in special education, and got out of biology, and I had all this research done and all this work, and I was finally recognized by the. Uh, uh, New York Explorers Club, and if you're not familiar with the New York Explorers Club, at the time that I was inducted, they only have 3,000 members worldwide, and uh, Sir Edmund Hillary was our, our president at the time, and uh, uh, some of the other members were, you know, Jacques Cousteau, John Glenn, uh, um, Jane Goodall, and uh, we have an annual meeting out at the Waldorf every year in, uh, in New York. And we get to meet all these people, rub elbows with it. But the, to be inducted, you have to have done one uh, kind of a, a unique, one of a kind uh, research. And it was finally recognized. So, anyhow, so that was kind of the. Uh, a change in time for me. I all of a sudden I, I was married. I had a family. I had a work, and uh, so some of the um, the things you know when I when I was up in Norway, the interesting thing is that the Norwegians go down these cliffs on ropes, rappel down, and they collect eggs. But they have to do it very early on when the egg egg is uh, first laid. And uh, so that, that's a big thing. So these guys actually showed me a little bit of their, their rope work. So I got involved in a little bit more climbing and so on. And uh, so I, I finally ended up turning my, I, I started a mountaineering camp out in Colorado over the summers when I was teaching. And my supplier, who is a kind of a, a national supplier to like the Gander Mountains and REIs and so on, the guy retired, I bought his business. And uh, so everything kind of panned out that, uh, so the next 35 years of my life, I actually had a distributorship and I, um, right here in Wisconsin, but I distributed nationally and it was heavy into mountaineering and backpacking. So it, uh, it, it landed a hand where some of the additional things I've, I've climbed, I went back and climbed the four tallest peaks in Iceland and been to Alaska climbing quite a, few times. So just one thing led to the other for me. So um, now we move ahead about 40 some years. And uh, just I hadn't, I, my wife was always interested in birding. We've done things like Costa Rica and so on. Uh, a little more of a, a tame uh, approach than uh, what I did with, with the uh, some of the 
things in North Atlantic, but uh, I was part of a, a zoological society, uh, Spinobo project, and uh, maybe some of you know um, Gay Reinhardt. So uh, we went and I'm showing you on a map here, we're nowhere land of, of, uh, uh, of the Congo. And there's a picture of Gay and myself. And um, so we, I was part of a four man team uh, five years ago, uh, Gay and I and two other gentlemen. And we, she's been working on bonobos for over 20 some years. And uh, uh, just to tell you a little bit about the project, I mean, this the project is in the middle of nowhere. You go down the Congo River and then the Salanga River. It's five days on on dugout canoes, fifty foot dugout canoes. Um, and it, it, I mean, it's the area is so rugged. You eat, sleep, pee, and poop out of the boat for five days just to get back into the the jungle area. So um, my task going along. Um, having a little bit of a, a construction background with my dad was to help establish a little bit of a base camp back in the uh, Salanga National Forest and uh, also then to hope, hopefully identify some of the, the, uh, the birds that uh, were back there because it's all part of the, the overall habitat. And right now you can see uh, I was fortunate enough um, even though they are studying bonobos uh, and they, they've been doing it for years, to actually see some is, is, is a, a real treat because uh, the, the way they take a census every night, the bonobos will uh, create a new nest. So her researchers, which are just some of the, the Congolese people that uh, she has hired, um, are going out and actually looking going with GPS is setting up a grid line and trying to find uh, and count nests. But uh, um, to be able to actually see Bonobo was, was a real treat. It was, we were there for three months and it was, I think it was the second or third last day that I was gonna be there. We did one more jaunt into the jungle and we, we heard them chattering and I, I, I got to uh, see them. And, some of the other birds, I just have a couple of pictures here. Some of the birds we took uh, coming up here next is, is uh, uh, a sunbird. Um, they don't have hummingbirds, surprisingly, in Africa. So, but their answer to our hummingbirds in the Americas is, is their sunbird. So it, it doesn't quite, quite have the, the same type of wing beat to, to hover in one spot, but similar and it, uh, this is a big nectar feeder. And one other bird I have up here is, is, uh, is the Congo weaver, excuse me, the, um, oh, you know, bob, bobtail weaver. So weavers are very common birds over there. are a lot of different types of weavers, just like we have a bunch of different thrushes or kingbirds here. And the, the unique thing about the weaver, if you're familiar, familiar with our, um, Orioles here, they have a hanging nest and that's where these birds get their uh, uh, name from. They have a very similar nest to, to that. All right, with that, I'm just going to back out of this program here. Um, Mary, I'm not sure how I get out of here now. So, oh, stop sharing, okay. And we're gonna just do a little, uh, I'm going to share another screen. I'm, I'm going to have a little program. This is where you're going to need your pencil and paper. So there's, there are each of the birds here. These are pictures of birds that I, I have taken. And uh, um, it's just going to be a little fun to see how many you can identify. And it's, it's to a, a musical beat. So if you want to turn your sound up a little bit. So it's going to be a, a program with music. And uh, so the, each picture is only on for six seconds. So you won't be able to write down the bird, but you might, I put a number with each bird and you can write down what number you think if you know them. And then afterwards, I'm gonna go through real quickly and let you know how many were correct. And this is where Mary's got the big, the big bucks up for anybody that can identify them. So, all right, here we go. <laughs> Look at the 
rocket launch the trophy wives of the astronauts and i won't listen to their words because i like birds a bird look high soaring through the sky it might be a bird and we'll know because birds have beaks birds can sing they've got lots and lots of feathers on their wings look they're flying in the must be a bird move your arms like a bird move your arms like a bird I hope you're all moving your sing arms. a song like a bird tweet 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 sing a song like a bird tweet 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 move your arms like a bird Sing a song like a bird. Tweet, tweet, tweet. Now move and sing like a bird. Tweet, tweet, tweet. Now move and sing like a bird. Tweet, tweet. All right. Birds have beaks. Birds can sing. 
They've got lots and lots of feathers on their wings. Look, they're flying in the air. It must be my oh my, what a wonderful day. Plenty of sunshine in my way. Zippity dee da, zippity yay. Mr. Bluebird's on my shoulder. It's the truth. It's actual. Everything is satisfactory. Zippity doo da, zippity yay. Wonderful feeling, wonderful day. Yes, sir. Zippity doo da, zippity yay. My, oh my, what a wonderful day. Mr. Bluebird's on my shoulder. It's the truth, it's actual. Everything is satisfactory. Zip for the do da, zip for the a. Wonderful feeling. Um, just going to do one more thing here. So um, I'm going to just go through real quick and, and tell you what birds you did see and see how many you think you got right. So I, you were at a big disadvantage because you didn't really know the location, which is a, a big part of, of the birds, but I'll go through real fast. I just want to point out this particular picture right here is my favorite all-time picture I ever took. And for several reasons, so many times I've spent hours and mornings in blinds and going through marshes or sitting in the bush and taking pictures, waiting for just the right picture. This particular picture, I was walking down a road and this upland sandpiper landed on a stump or a little tree stump about 30 feet away. I turned towards him. I just had a chance at doing one shot before he flew away again. And it's been my favorite picture because, you know, the, the uh, contrast is right. The depth of field, you can see how the background is blurred out. I got that what I call live eye, that little twinkle in his eye, which you try to shoot for whenever you take a bird picture, gives that, that bird some life, whatever. But uh, just one of my all time favorite pictures and the easiest picture ever for me to take. So most pictures, it takes about 50 to 100 pictures to get one good one. Anyhow, with that said, we're gonna go through it. So Upland Sandpiper, and why aren't, oh, there we go. The next is the white-breasted nuthatch. I have those around here. Next, 
not around here, probably thought it was a black cap chickadee. It's a Carolina round, it's a Carolina chickadee that I got, I have it written wrong there, it's Carolina chickadee. All right, Stellar J, Colorado area. Our kingbird, Eastern kingbird, which we have here, that white base on the tail is a good, I'm sorry. Oh, it's not catching up. All right. Mary just told me I'm going a little too fast. All right. So next coming up, we should be the tufted titmouse. All right. Next is the semi-palmated um, sandpiper. I think we all have seen these around our bird feeders, the uh, rose-breasted grosbeak. This one we don't have around here. It's called, uh, the next one is coming up is a, a black skimmer. And take a look at its beak, very unique. See how the bottom part of its beak is a lot longer than the top and they actually skim right along the, the surface of the, of the ocean catching fish. Next is a, a caisson's finch. Once again, not found here, but found up in the Rockies. This is a male caisson's finch. We might have a female in here too, I'm not sure. This one, next one up is the uh, great horned owl. We hear those around here a lot, so have those. Next, we have a white pelican. And if you're wondering what that stuff is on the top of its bill, for some reason, um, during uh, breeding season, a lot of the birds uh, will, will get those gross on the top of their bill. Here's something we have around here, the Eastern Tohi, we used to call uh, Rufus sided Tohi. I used to love that name, Rufus sided Tohi, but this is a Tohi that we, we find in this area. Here's something else uh, that we have in, in uh, this area is an osprey. And if you take a look in his talons there, he, he just caught a fish. So it was kind of neat. He just came and landed close to me. Uh, something not in this area, the black billed magpie. It's a, a Colorado bird. Uh, next, uh, once again, the Arizona type bird. He's actually standing on a Sonora cactus. So the hint is that he's a, a Sonora um, uh, cactus wren, excuse me. Uh, Avocet, uh, I'm not sure. I I've see these a little farther west. They have an upturned bill, makes it very unique. Uh, kind of a neat looking bird, once again, a shorebird. Red winged blackbird, I think we've all seen those a lot around a little bit. Summer tanager, it's the next thing on the menu. Okay, next, uh, once again, you might have thought this was a black cat chickadee, but if you notice, his head has a little white band above the eye. So this is a mountain chickadee, mountain chickadee. One of our thrushes we have in this area, Swainson's thrush. Next is a brown-headed cowbird. More research is done on this bird in the United States than any other bird, believe it or not. It's because it lays its eggs in other birds' nests and lets them, uh, those females, rear, rear its, its young. Something we have, you can find these down in the, the harbor in Port Washington. The, red-breasted mergansers. Now we're getting to the, some of the smaller birds, the palm warbler. Okay, we have yellow-headed blackbirds, which is coming up uh, in Wisconsin. You can find those in Horicon. You just, they're a little more solitary bird than the, the, the uh, um, normal blackbirds, but uh, if you, Get deeper into the marsh, you can find those. Brown pelican is next. Coming up here is a burrowing owl. This was actually another lucky sight. I was, I was filming that avocet on the sh shoreline uh, out in Nebraska. I, I, Nebraska, believe it or not, uh, the western part of Nebraska is a fantastic birding location. And uh, all of a sudden I see something, I'm in a blind, I see something pop out over to the side and I look and here it's a mom and a young burrowing owl. They actually burrow and live in some of the, the 
uh, groundhog holes. There's something we have in this area, uh, American goldfinch, not in its true gold color right now. Something else we have a lot around are the gray catbird. If you look carefully, you can see like a little darker spot on his crown of his head. And also there's a rufous colored spot on the base of his tail. So we have those in this area. Black vulture not found here, over a little farther south, you'll find a black vulture. We have turkey vultures up into this area. I don't know if anybody got this one. This is a female rose breasted grosbeak in, found in this area. Next, we have green herons. We have green herons in this area. Well, this is an Eastern Phoebe. Once again, we all have Phoebes in this area and you can see those, uh, the little feathers around his mouth and they'll fly with their mouth open and catch bugs. It's, it's kind of cool to be able to see those uh, in that particular area. It's our, the only hummingbird around here, ruby-throated hummingbird. Black-crowned night heron. Once again, we, you, I've seen, I have seen these up at the Horicon area. Sandhill crane. And uh, we have a lot of those now. I'll tell you, 40, 50 years ago, when I used to be working out in the marshes, you'd really have to hunt to try to find a crane, but you see cranes everywhere nowadays. And uh, here's a wren. And uh, it's not our house wren that we have in this area. This is a Carolina wren. So this is one that not knowing where the picture was taken would have been kind of hard. This is an immature white ibis. Okay, kind of a neat, unique bill. When you see that bill, you know it's an ibis. We only have, I think, four ibises or so in, in the States. Here is a, a meadow lark. This is particular one is a, a Western meadow lark. Next coming up is a, a curlew, a long bill curlew. And uh, I just stumbled upon this guy and I must have been near her nest and she was circling around allowing me to take all these cool pictures because I was must have been standing close to where some of her, her uh, young were or her eggs were. And here we have a green kingfisher. Uh, we don't have any of these close by. Southwest we might find those. And uh, we have a belted kingfisher up in this area. And uh, here's a great egret. And what's kind of unique about this picture is that the snow egret has black legs and yellow feet. This guy was so nice to hold its black foot up in the air. So it's a really unique way of identifying that it's a, it's a great egret. Something else we have around here and a beautiful voice sings. You'll hear it, one of the first birds, I, other than the cardinals and some of those, that I'll hear in spring is the brown thrasher. I love this bird. Long, a very long tail, a very distinctive tail. This is the uh, northern mockingbird. There's something that you probably see at your feeders. If you got food out at your feeders right now, you'll see downy, and then there's the hairy, which looks almost identical, just a little bit bigger, the downy and hair, hairy uh, woodpeckers. One a shorebird once again. I once again I filmed this one out in uh, Nebraska. This is a Wilson's fowl rope. There seem to be everywhere, and they they do a unique uh, fishing. They, they swim in tight circles. I don't know if they're stirring up the fish and then they'll dive down for the fish. Okay, our song sparrow. We have song sparrows around here. All right, this is a tropical kingbird. Uh, once again, not found this far north. It would be down Mexico way, maybe. Uh, you might find some in Arizona. All right. And if you look carefully, you can see a little spot of yellow on its rump here. This is the yellow rump warbler, fairly common warbler to this area. And here we have a, a Nashville warbler. Um, 
I'm not sure. I didn't film this one here. I don't know if I've ever seen a Nashville warbler in, in Wisconsin, but they could be here. We have a turkey. And next we have another ibis, the unique bill. This is a white-faced ibis. I know that because once again, I filmed this in Nebraska. There's a glossy ibis that looks very, very similar. Doesn't have that red eye. Usually they have a little more white around their eye and, and above their bill there, but the, this one didn't, but that is a, a white-faced ibis. Next is a gray jay. Sometimes they call this the lumberjack bird. If you've ever been out in Western states and you're sitting at a picnic table, it's not unusual to have this gray jay come and land and start stealing some of your food. Our blue jay, have those around here. And here's one of Mary's birds taken right out on one of Mary's feeders out here, our Eastern bluebird. Here's a, a willet. All right, once again, filmed in Nebraska. I think you might find those in Horicon area. And the unique thing about it, it was so nice that he lifted his wings up because when they're flying, the black and white uh, color of their wings makes it very distinctive to, to uh, identify. This is an American Red Star. Once again, we will have those in this area. Northern Cardinal. We have a Cape May Warbler. If you see the little brownish spot around the eye, that's kind of the distinctive characteristic of Cape May. Cason's Kingbird, almost identical to that tropical Kingbird you saw once again down in the Southwest. Indigo Bunting, something that we have up here. Greater Prairie Chicken, if you go up into uh, Wausau area, I believe it is, or Stevens Point area, there's. Uh, an area where the, uh, they, the prairie chicken used to be found in every county of Wisconsin 80 years ago, and now it's only in like one or two counties in the state. Something we don't have here, this was a Costa Rican bird, a magnis, magnis, magnificent hummingbird, excuse me. <laughs> Here's a bird that we have in this area, the uh, yellow warbler. You can see the distinctive kind of brownish streaks in its breast. This is a Mexican bird. This is the uh, yellow-tailed oriole, something that we don't have up here. I had to throw a few of these in there to trick you up so you didn't get Mary's money. This is the uh, magnolia warbler. All right, you can see the, the white mark over the eye and the white wing, heavy white wing bar something that we have in this area, the Black Burnian Warbler, once again, something we find here in Wisconsin. Uh, something I have never seen here, once again, this is a Nebraska bird, a, long, a logger-headed shrike. We have a, a, we have a sh shrike, I can't, um, here, and, and, uh, but not the loggerhead that I know of. All right, this is American Tree Sparrow. This is something that uh, in wintertime will see more of they'll they'll come they this is kind of their southern southern base and you might think this was a uh, um the, the the normal dove that we have here but if you look at the tail you don't see the uh the pointy tail this is a eurasian collared dove okay uh, evening grosbeak filmed in wisconsin don't see them too much but they're around this is a dark-eyed junco, and this is a Western, uh, Western uh, version of, of the dark-eyed junco. Our juncos don't usually have that prominent rufous color on their back like that. Something we have here, the house finch. Not unusual to have house finches at uh, your feeders. Um, this is the white-throated sparrow. I filmed this once again in the Carolinas, but I believe we, I uh, have to ask Mary, I think we do have those here occasionally. And here's our good old American rock and robin. All right. Next up is our Baltimore Oriole, pretty common bird around here. And there's the one that we see and hear around our black cap chickadee. This is a 
white crowned sparrow. Our robin once again, and a female cardinal. And this is put in to make sure you didn't get Mary's money. This is a really a rare African bird with a very small 100 mile range in Africa, in, in uh, Central Eastern Africa, the rufous tail palm thrush. So I had you covered there, Mary. So anyhow, any questions? Mary, do you have anything that uh, came up as questions? One, one is about the ivory, uh, ivory billed woodpecker. No, that was just a joke. My dad did not see an ivory billed woodpecker. So. <laughs> well, everyone, so. feel free to unmute yourselves and ask questions if you like. We have time for one or two. And there were claims that the ivory billed woodpecker still exists down in Arkansas. You know, John, those come up. <laughs> every every year some of these things they have one or there's been some sightings you can go on to youtube and there's some pictures of people that have actually filmed some that they swear are ivory build but uh the pros are saying no that uh, they officially have called it extinct i believe like, like in the last couple of years i believe isn't it right mary yes yeah they have um but again like you said every every year there is another sighting people swear that it, you know that is a uh, an ivory bill, but you know, they haven't any proof. So they just catch some of the pileatids and they put some white marking <laughs> on the bill and make it look like an ivory bill. That must be quite a trick. And Sue says, great program. So thank you, Sue. Oh, you're welcome. It was very enjoyable. I yep. agree. Sue, Anybody some last those, uh, questions? Some of those birds, there. Sue, should be down in your area that I was showing there. So Yes, they are. They are the cactus wren for sure. And yep. uh, we actually have a goldfinch that is so brightly colored. Uh, the male and female were flying around and picking off the um, dead flowers that were on some of our bushes here and stuff. And, you know, just the little seeds that are left. Sure. And it's, it's so much fun. But we also have white pelicans which okay. are very unusual here, but okay. they're on our local lakes. We have two lakes here and uh, it's fun to see them every day. There's a couple dozen of them. Wow. Yeah, yeah, Lucky. neat, neat. Yeah, they're seen here in Wisconsin too, in places like Horicon or up in Green Bay. Now they're just starting to make a comeback in this area. Pretty fun. It Any is, other? it is. One, one more question from anybody. Dan, could you elaborate just a skosh on the Explorers Club? It sounds so intriguing. Yeah, well, it, it was started like almost a hundred years ago. And uh, so they, they've been meeting once a year for where they get all their members and worldwide, like I said, they have like 3000 um, members. And I'm trying to think of the famous journalist who was a member, but he donated his house just off of Central Park and that uh, kind of a mansion actually. And that's the home base for the Explorers Club. But uh, to be able to, to get into it, you, you have to be sponsored by two other members and then you have to write somewhat of a master's thesis showing <laughs> some original uh, uh, original work. And uh, you know, it's really, Dan, kind of interesting because there are three people of River Edge that are Explorer members, okay, uh, Eric, uh, Larson was uh, inducted, I think, about two years ago, and then I uh, uh, introduced uh, Gay Reinhardt for her work for the Bonobos, and she is also a member. So it's really kind of unique that three people from River Edge or connected with River Edge are, are Explorer Club members. So, do you go to the annual dinner? You know, I did years ago. I haven't gone for the last twenty years. I kind of uh, lost touch a little bit with it, you know, but it, it was kind of fun in the beginning. And uh, uh, some, of, you, some of the unique explorers were, were there. And uh, so uh, you got to meet everybody and it was kind of a fancy, but very casual event. So, yeah. I have well, to thank you too, for putting in bird is the word <laughs> as one of your songs from the sixties. Our kids didn't believe yeah. it existed till we pulled it up for them. Excellent. 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, we are so lucky to have Dan with us here on the staff. He is a, a unique explorer in, in everyone's eyes here. We're uh, really thrilled to have him as an educator and a carpenter and all the other things he does. He's a jack of all trades, but thank you again. And also thank you for throwing in a couple of those um, birds that no one would know. So I didn't have to uh, pay out the million dollars here today. So thanks a lot for an entertaining yeah, program. Big, those big bucks waiting there, Mary, too. I, I know. know. Just... <laughs> well, I, was, I was sure somebody was going to make it here today. You make all a million dollars on me today. So, so anyhow, I want to remind everybody that the next tea and topic will be March 10th. And uh, the speaker will be, um, maybe some of you know him too, um, Richard Gonzalez. He used to be a principal in, in Grafton. And uh, he is going to be speaking on Native American um, traditions surrounding the maple syrup season and the sturgeon spawning season. So join us then again on March 10th at one o'clock on Zoom. So thank you all for attending today. And thanks again, Dan. And we'll see you out there on the trail. Thank you, Dan. Okay, get out there and watch your birds, everybody. All right, bye-bye. Bye. 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 -bye. bye, -bye.